So, Professor <laughs> Joanna Dunkley from Oxford University, who's the uh, A Fowler Award winner, Observing the Early Universe. Thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks for giving me the chance to speak about this. I'm going to be talking mostly today, um, or today, about the stuff that I um, spend most of my time working on, which is observing and analysing um, the cosmic microwave background. So this is the, the, the oldest light we get to see, the light we get to see from uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the point at which the universe became um, neutral. It transitioned from being a fully ionised hot place um, and cooled down enough as it was expanding and growing to suddenly become neutral such that hydrogen atoms could form and photons that were previously scattering off this, these um, electrons in this hot plasma could now travel freely through us for, you know, for the next 14 billion years. And we measure that today and it's, it's something that you know, this year, 2015, is the 50th anniversary of this light's discovery. Um, it was measured, first of all, serendipitously um, in New Jersey um, by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. <coughs> Um, and then a couple of decades later, mapped out in this <laughs> orange blob <laughs> on the sky. <laughs> so this is the CMB. Uh, this is a map of the microwave background, the average temperature of this light that receive, we're receiving today. And the blob is simply an all-sky map all around us that we unwrap onto you know, the screen. Um, and on average, it's all 2.7 degrees Kelvin. It's all the same temperature. Um, and just the fact that we see this orange blob, this, this light, this microwave light now, it's all in the microwave regime. The fact that we see it all around <coughs> us um, was, in, you know, what it first taught us was the Big Bang happened. You know, when it was first discovered, there was a lot of controversy over, you know, was it steady state theory? Did the Big Bang happen? Um, a lot of disagreement. But to have this light reaching us now that's got the same temperature everywhere on the sky is isotropic and reaching us um, from all directions means that once upon a time it had to all be in contact. Um, and we, it came from a point at which the universe was in thermal equilibrium when everything was much more condensed um, and is the natural outcome of the hot Big Bang scenario. So this was kind of piece, piece, piece one of what this, 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 this light has taught us. This was mapped out by the COBE satellite um, back in 1990. We've had this, we've had incredible luck in the CMB. We've had this series of beautiful satellite missions that have mapped, that we've used to map out this microwave background light, coupled with a whole slew of telescopes from the ground and from balloons that have complemented these satellites. And we've now had three of these. So we had COBE in 1990, and then we had WMAP um, in 2001, that ran for almost a decade. And then most recently, we've had the Planck satellite measuring the sky because there's actually Unsurprisingly, there's more information than just in that, in that map. So, so the, the project that I've been working on um, in the last few years is the Planck satellite, um, a large European project run by the European Space Agency, many contributors in, in the UK, um, and a very large team of scientists in Europe and around the world. Um, Planck's pictured here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty huge. A person is around this high. Um, it's a large microwave telescope that launched... Um, back in 2009 um, and observed for a couple of years, well actually for a few years with, with the whole telescope, um, out at Lagrange Point L2, a million miles from here. And with that, we made, we've made kind of the, the, you know, the current best map of the CMB, which is a lot more informative. So what I'm showing you here is now not just the average temperature of the CMB. This is showing the, um, the anisotropy in the CMB, CMB light, in the temperature of the CMB. I've subtracted the mean and I'm showing you what the fluctuations in the CMB light are. And the scale here, I'm sorry, I haven't got the scale on the map, it's um, minus 200 to 200 microcalvin. So this is, this, these are fluctuations around a mean temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. So the fluctuations we see here are one part in 100,000. And the color scale is such that where you see the, the, blobby, the blobby red spots, it's ever so slightly hotter than average, and the blue spot's ever so slightly colder. And, and this map, again, this is the map over the full sky, um, uh, with oriented such that the, ga the galaxy is actually along here. That's how we choose to show these, these CMB maps. Um, well, let me, t let me digress a moment. This map you can't just make with one frequency in, a, in an instrument. Planck observed the sky at nine frequencies. 
um, and to actually make a map of the CMB, one has to disentangle the CMB that's the furthest light from all the stuff that's in between. And that all the stuff that's in between includes our own Milky Way galaxy, that's the closest thing in between, <coughs> and all of the galaxies that lie between us and the CMB. So when we show this map, that's, that's we've sort of cleverly combined different wavelengths to pull out the CMB signal. And the thing that really distinguishes the CMB from everything else is the CMB is a perfect black body, or as perfect a black body as we can find in nature. Um, and everything else is, is not. <laughs> the galaxy, particularly, is, is not a black body. So, so taking this, we, can, we, we get to do a whole lot of physics with this. We, the, when we talk about learning things about the universe, such as what it's made of, how old it is, how fast it's growing, how much dark matter there is, how much dark energy there is, we get all of those numbers, the most precise numbers we have, really come from this map. There's a lot of other information we have astronomically, a lot of other data that we get to see and combine and, and look at, but really it's coming from, from here. Um, and, and the physics of what's showing up here is, is <coughs> that the reason, the reason we can extract so much information from this you know, blobby map is that the physics from time zero up to when this light set off is pretty simple. <laughs> it's a lot simpler than a lot of the physics that happened later in the universe. Um, what we think was going on is, is right at the beginning, uh, in the first fraction of a second, and I'll come back to that fraction of a second soon, um, we think we imp that there was imprinted some initial fluctuations in the universe. And this is one of the big questions is, you know, how do we get, how do we get structure in the universe today? Where did all the things we see now, the, the, the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies, where did they come <coughs> from? And what we come back to here is the very origins of it, the very beginnings <laughs> Of the very first features and we're capturing these features in this map at 400,000 years but before that what we think happened is some initial irregularities were put in at early times they then evolved and the evolution is kind of simple you just have gravity um, and you have gravity in a universe filled with a couple of things or a few things imagine the universe you've got you've got dark matter we've got regular baryons things we're made of and photons and if you put in initial, initial fluctuations, initial ripples, and let them evolve, then what happens is things try to collapse. And if you've got baryons trying to fall in, they fall in. But if the universe is ionized and the baryons are coupled to the photons, such that the photons are scattering off them and then there's tightly coupled plasma, then the pressure of the photons somewhat competes with the gravity of the baryons. And you set up sound waves in the coupled photon-baryon fl plasma. And that propagates, as so sound waves begin to propagate through space, imprinted at time zero. Meanwhile, dark matter that's not tightly coupled to photons, because photons doesn't scatter off dark matter, <laughs> starts to gravitationally collapse. And, and, and we, can, we can follow that evolution. We have numerical codes that say, put in what you think went in at the beginning, let that evolve, and you know, say what's going to come out of 400,000 years. And our codes can do that incredibly well. It's linear physics. Um, it, you know, it's not totally trivial, but it's, it's, it's trivial enough that we can predict to, you know, sub-percent accuracy what we should expect to see here. Okay, so, one, so, so what we certainly find out, and unsurprisingly, is that when we capture this, this, these fluctuations in the light here, we're seeing the beginnings of the seeds of structure. So it's this, these, are the, these fluctuations are what later produce... Uh, the origins of the structure that we see millions of years later. Because those, those fluctuations, those one part in 100,000 fluctuations, um, the temperature traces out the overdensities in space. Um, now, it turns out that where the, where the CMB is slightly hotter are actually parts of space that are slightly less dense than average. Um, because where you have... Um, uh, actually, where you have an overdensity... Uh, the CMB photons actually have to climb out of the upper density. It makes them cooler. Um, so where you have, so you should think of the CMB light as more or less tracing the overdensities in the universe at, at that time of formation, but in, in the opposite sense to uh, which was more or less dense. But certainly, if you had an overdensity in space at 400,000 years, then if you simply evolve the universe on, allow gravity to, to play, its, play its role, then eventually you'll get overdensities large enough that the very first stars can form. 
Um, but at the time we're looking at them, they're not nearly large enough fluctuations to, to actually form things like stars. We're seeing them at the point where they're just very small, very small over densities in an almost featureless space. So very simple. So we're seeing the beginnings of the evolution of the later universe, but we can also do more than that. The, th the thing we really use, you know, when we say oh, we can figure out all these numbers telling you about what the universe is made of, the piece of information we get most of that from is the power spectrum of that map. Now what we do is we decompose that map <coughs> into, well, if we take a two-point function, a power spectrum of it, where well, we're looking at the variance in that map as a function of angular scale. So we're saying, what are the different, how, how, how large are the fluctuations as a function of different scales? So we're splitting the map onto, up into, into sort of regions of sky that are on 90 degree scale through to degree scale down to sub-degree scale. And this data in, in red is what we extract from the, from the Planck map. And you see you know, this, this remarkable feature, these acoustic, acoustic oscillations um, that are the signature, the beautifully precise signature of sound waves that have travelled, that have been imprinted at the Big Bang, that have evolved for 400,000 years, and we're seeing them at 400,000 years. And, and so you see this, this acoustic peak structure where, for example, this peak at one degree corresponds to the exact scale where a sound wave has just had time to reach the maximal compression when the CMB was formed at 400,000 years. That's that, exactly that wavelength. And these are higher harmonics of different wavelengths. Uh, these peaks here correspond to different wavelengths that have undergone multiple oscillations and um, undergone multiple you know, compressions, rarefactions to reach that point. And so this is now measured with, you know, before Planck, we'd measured, with doubly map, we measured this spectrum out to around here. We measured these scales here. Planck had higher resolution, a larger telescope, more sensitivity. And we've squeezed these, the, the errors in the data points remarkably so that we're seeing over a very large, very large range of angular scales um, this, sign this signature in the map. And this power spectrum is sort of our cosmological fingerprint. Every power spectrum of a different, you take any a universe with a particular contents, a particular initial conditions, particular initial fluctuations. You can put that into, and we have numerical codes to do this, you can put it in and you can predict what this power spectrum should be. And one of the things that I do is, you know, I, I sort of compute this power spectrum from the maps and we, and we search through all the possible cosmological models until we find that, you know, that green one that fits the data so well. And that green one is our best cosmological model right now. Um, and it's what, it's, it's what we call Lambda CDM. It's a flat universe. It has um, just less than 70% of it in dark energy, 25% um, in dark matter, and 5% in baryons. Um, and, and it really fits incredibly well. And as we've continued to measure the CMB over the last decade, particularly with Planck, we found this model just keeps fitting. We measure the CMB at higher resolution. We measure its polarization as well. Um, and it just keeps working. Um, this incredibly simple model um, just seems to fit. And whatever we try and do to put in more complications just doesn't work. And for example, if we look back at the time when the universe was 400,000 years old, um, when the CMB was formed, then this is the, kind of, this is the pie chart of what we, the universe was for, made of back then. It's not a pie chart that is shown all that often, actually. The pie chart we show more often in cosmology is what the universe is made of today, right? This is what the universe was made of when the CMB formed. Um, and so around 60% of it was dark matter. You know, a little, little more than 10% was atoms. Um, and the rest of it was photons and neutrinos. So the photons and neutrinos back then made up a much, much larger proportion of the energy density. And the thing that's, that's strikingly missing back then was any dark energy. So the contribution that we now talk of a lot, this cosmological constant, this, this, this stuff that's making the universe accelerate, back then it was negligible. Um, and we can now constrain, actually with Planck, we can put it at you know, the sub-percent level of what it could have been back then. <coughs> so the universe back then was quite different in terms of energy density makeup to what it was now. But certainly the big questions are, you know, at this time, this large proportion was dark matter. And even though uh, it, it looks like the dark matter is simply behaving 
like uh, not very strongly interacting particle. Um, it's still a, you know, a big mystery to us at what it is. And we can go a certain way in cosmology to try and understand that. We can simulate this as a simulation of what we think the dark matter evolves to become um, billions of years later. This is the um, simulation that, that those in Durham and, and others um, are created, sort of showing what the dark matter web we think becomes um, as we evolve it. But we're still just, we, we, you know, we haven't, we haven't yet identified what this particle is. Um, so, so in cosmology, we can sort of say very precisely, this is the amount of dark matter there is. Um, but we're not yet telling you, you know, what, what it actually is. So one of the big questions that we're trying to answer at the moment, that I'm certainly trying to answer, is what put in the initial fluctuations? I can put in um, a very simple description for how I can perturb the universe at time zero. And as I said, I can evolve it through, and it matches really well to what I see at 400,000 years. But our big question is, what put in those initial fluctuations? And the current best scenario is inflation. Um, and this is an effective field theory. It says that back at time zero, um, that the expansion of the universe was driven by some scalar field, we call it inflaton, and that the universe exponentially expanded for you know, a very small fraction of a second. And that expansion was driven by the potential of some scalar field. And inflation has a lot of attractions. It was, you know, we, it was Alan Guth and others came up with it, later others developed it further, because it explains why the universe should be geometrically flat. Um, uh, and it explains why we see um, the CMB to be so isotropic. And it also now very nicely provides a mechanism for seeding the primordial fluctuations. Inflation says that you have quantum fluctuations that are imprinted during the inflationary process. But as you exponentially expand the universe, a quantum fluctuation gets frozen in macroscopically because it suddenly becomes very large, and so large that it's not in causal contact anymore, and it's sort of stuck in there forever. And as the universe inflates, you keep laying down these quantum fluctuations um, on tiny scales, and you keep inflating them to large scales. And you end up with what we call an almost scale invariant spectrum of initial fluctuations, um, which says that you know, in, in log bins, you have the same size fluctuations on all scales. And that's exactly what we see with the Planck data. If we look at the Planck data, and you know, I t you know, we, what, we, what we do is we sort of fit, we say, I'm going to assume the fluctuations are that simple, and I fit for an amplitude and a scale, scale, a scale um, dependence or a spectral index of my fluctuations, just two numbers. And I can fit that to the Planck data. And I get this, this incredible fit. You can see the green curve fits the red data incredibly well. And that comes from just putting in these very simple fluctuations that are what quantum this, this, this mechanism, inflation mechanism, would predict. And there are many other ways of seeding primordial fluctuations that are not like that. Um, you can come up with all sorts of scenarios that put in initial perturbations to the universe. And there's no way they could be described as simply as just two numbers. Um, furthermore, they, they would predict that the fluctuations in the CMB should be Gaussian, which means if I take that map of the CMB and I plot it, the distribution, the temperature, it's a perfect Gaussian. It is. We see that with Planck, and we see that even better with Planck than we had done before with different <coughs> instruments. So everything looks incredibly consistent with inflation, but we just don't know if it happened. Um, and we're extrapolating to such enormous um, energies and such early times and such unusual conditions um, that, that we're... That, you know, it's a big extrapolation. And I think you'd ask many cosmologists, you know, is inflation the right scenario? And many of them say yes, but we, we, we just don't know that yet. So one of the predictions it makes um, is, um, is inflation predicts gravitational waves. So at the same time as seeding this, this quantum fluctuations that inflation should, should imprint, um, at the same time as, as, as imprinting quantum fluctuations that will produce density fluctuations, that will produce the, the ripples in... In, um, in the universe that will seed structure, it will produce gravitational waves. <laughs> and, uh, this is just an old cartoon of, a, of, of how a gravitational wave traveling towards you um, should affect, uh, should, should st stretch and shrink the space time. So imagine that one over there, a gravitational wave passing towards you is going to uh, shrink and stretch space time. 
like that little cartoon shows. So growing and growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking, or in this alternative orientation as well. Um, now we hear a lot about gravitational waves produced by <coughs> compact objects, by inspiring <coughs> black holes. Um, we hope to see evidence of those from advanced LIGO soon. I'm excited about that. Um, but these ones are printed, we think, at inflation itself. Um, the trouble is, the amount that they produce uh, will depend on the strength of inflation. The stronger the energy scale of inflation, the stronger or larger signal of gravitational waves we should see. So that means inflation might have happened, but at a scale at which we will never see gravitational waves, even if they're there. Or inflation might not have happened, in which case we probably wouldn't see gravitational waves. Um, but it's quite possible that inflation did happen and did produce gravitational waves at a strength that we will see in the next decade. And that's what we're all chasing. Um, because if we can see these things, then we really, it's very hard to come up with a way of producing <coughs> these things without the mechanism of, of inflation. And so we all got terribly excited last year because, I'm sorry, um, because this announcement was made from the, the BICEP2 experiment at the South Pole that this signal had been seen. Now, how do we see it? This is what many of us, this is what I, I spend a lot of my time working on. If a gravitational wave was passing through, so this is just a little cartoon of, um, of um, the polarization of light. So, what we, so we, use this, we use the polarization of the CMB to look for gravitational waves. Because if a gravitational wave was passing through space when the CMB formed, when the universe transitioned to being neutral, it would polarize a CMB photon. And the so description of that is imagine the way that you get polarization of CMB light is if you have free electrons and you have photons scattering off them and then towards you, imagine you're the observer of the CMB. If the photons that scatter off that electron have a quadrupole pattern, so for example, hotter light coming in from the sides than above and below, then that sort of hot light from the sides wins out as it scatters towards you, Thompson scattering, and the light comes out net polarized like this, right? Whereas if I had isotropic light, so the same, <laughs> the same amount, top and bottom as side to side, it comes out net unpolarized. So I need this situation where I have sort of more light coming in here than here to make the light come out polarized towards you. And if a gravitational wave, so going back to my little cartoon, <laughs> imagine that, um, that one, right, coming towards, coming, scattering off an electron during the combination when the CMB was forming. If you had a gravitational wave stretching space in this way and you had an electron that, that CMB photons were scattering off, then the motion of, sort of space induced by this gravitational wave uh, would induce a quadrupole in the pattern of the CMB radiation around an electron. And, then the, and the CMB would then scatter off and come towards you polarized. So, in summary, <laughs> a gravitational wave polarizes the CMB photons. And it polarizes them with um, a type of pattern that actually regular density fluctuations, the things that, that we look at from structure, don't, don't produce. And this is what was reported, was seen last year by, by the BICEP2 experiment pictured here at the South Pole. It's that little one there. This is the much larger South Pole telescope. Um, and this is a little map up in the corner of a small patch of sky in the CMB. This is a map of the polarization directions of the, of the microwave light measured at 150 gigahertz, where the little uh, sticks, the black sticks, show the orientation of the photons on the sky. Um, and the thing that we're looking for when we look for gravitational wave signature is we're looking on average for the sort of handed signature on the sky of the polarization angles. Um, because it's, that's a kind of pattern that regular structure formation just can't produce in the, in the polarization, and only gravitational waves can. And you can kind of see it there around that point. Those, those polarization vectors have this handed pattern around there as well, around that red spot. And so polarization has certainly been discovered um, in, in, the CM, in, in the microwave sky. Um, but what's become clear in the last year, uh, and we knew it really at the time, is that this was a, a totally premature um, claim because there's no way that we can currently distinguish between the background CMB polarization 
and the polarization from the galaxy. Um, and there was no way we could do it a year ago, and there's still no way we can do it now. Uh, we haven't got enough information yet. The reason for this is the galaxy is really polarized. Um, and a year ago, we had no idea how polarized it was, and now we just know a little bit better how polarized it is. Dust grains um, tend to align with the magnetic field in our galaxy. If you imagine a dust grain to be maybe this bottle, <laughs> and you have a magnetic field that aligns up with the plane of the galaxy, dust grains tend to align perpendicular to magnetic field um, by radiative torques. They, they, they line up like this, and they preferentially emit then along their long axis if the dust grain is, is elongated. Um, and what that means is that, the, that huh, these, are, these are tiny dust grains heated up by starlight that then emit thermally. And if they have this elongated pattern, um, and if they align well with the field, then they come up and they're very polarized. And it contaminates our CMB signal quite a lot. And it's our biggest challenge now, is to separate out that signal um, from um, the CMB. And with Planck, just earlier this year, we managed to make the first, first, um, first map at frequencies. This is at 350 gigahertz. This is in the same kind of frequency regime that we look at for the CMB. This is a map of the polarization of dust grains over the sky. Um, so you can see the galactic plane runs along the middle, but you have this kind of significant amount off the galactic plane too of, of polarized dust um, that, that really extends quite far away. Um, the BICEP experiment was looking down there, which visually obviously is a place where the dust emission is not super high. Um, but it's not zero. Um, and, and so it's quite clear that the, the signal that was seen is, can be completely explained by dust emission. What we have to do now, and what, we're, what, what, what many of us are doing now, this is still an interesting question. We still want to find gravitational waves. Um, we still think inflation would produce them. And, and in the next decade, we have a prospect of finding them. We just need to go and map the sky at many frequencies because we need to be able to separate out the emission of dust grains from the galaxy from the CMB. So the thing that, the experiment that I'm working on is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Pictured here, this is a, on the plateau in Chile, just nearby, so Alma is kind of like over there. <laughs> if, you turn, if you turn around, Alma's kind of actually where you guys are. Um, and this is our micro telescope hidden inside this ground screen, so you can't see it. Um, and it's one of the current ground-based experiments that are, that are mapping out the CMB polarization um, hunting for these gravitational waves. There are these kind of two sets of experiments, one set at the South Pole and one set here in Chile. Um, and our strategy is going to be to map out half the sky in polarization, um, scanning 20,000 square degrees in you know, five or more wavelengths to separate out those signals. Um, our plan is to say, well, I need to see a signal over there and over there and over there and over there, and they better all agree, and I better see it in multiple wavelengths. Um, um, and with that, I think that, it, that there's a chance of getting there. It's clearly going to be a challenge to us. And at the same time, we're actually going to learn an awful lot of interesting things about um, the dust properties, uh, you know, how it aligns, what it's made of, and also the magnetic field of the galaxy. So there's going to be kind of a lot of exciting astrophysics that we're going to learn um, with these observations at the same time as, as discovering the cosmology. Um, so um, you know, we have an exciting uh, decade ahead of us in this field. Thanks. I hardly dare ask the obvious question, is that do you need another space mission? <laughs> I actually think, this is actually a very interesting question, I don't think we need one yet. What I do think is that I think it's a big shame that the UK decided to pull out of any of these ground-based CMB experiments. Right now, all of the ground-based CMB work happens in the States. None of it happens in Europe. I work on this because we work on a US experiment, and my team do the analysis for US experiments. But, um, uh, and so there are many people in the Europe who disagree with me and say we need a satellite. I think we can make a huge amount of progress from the ground, and so I, we need to do that. So space committee members remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you don't sound very confident that the, uh, the current extension of, of um, BICEP will actually solve the problem? I think that it will help, but no, I, I think that it will take more than another year or two to get there, because with the current... So 
if you only have three wavelengths, which is what the current extension of BICEP has, you've got synchrotron emission, dust emission, and the CMB. And if you've got three wavelengths and three components, they better be really simple components to get the CMB, and they might be, but I don't think you can trust it. So I think we, 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 will, we may get very interesting upper limits, but to make a detection, I think you need more wavelengths than that. And I think you also need to be able to look in different regions of the sky to make sure it's isotropic. So I think that the progress will certainly be made, but I think if we're looking for a, you know, a, a watertight detection, then we need the few years after that and the, the, slight, you know, the slight next step. They're, they're, they're quite hoping to halve the sensitivity or something like that. I think so, but it's, it's not just sensitivity. That's not enough. It's not enough. You need oh, right. multiple, multiple wavelengths, which they have got. So they've got three compared to one, and that definitely helps. Um, but I think you need... I mean, so the dust could be weird, right? There could be magnetic... There's, you know, talk to Bruce Drain or other dust experts, and they, they can, you know, come up with all sorts of interesting <laughs> and exotic dust physics that could say, you know, are you sure? <laughs> Yeah. We take one more question, then we need to move on to fit the other two. My only a small one. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Excellent presentation. Do you know something? I don't know how you differentiate between dark matter and energy. Is that experiment? What did you do? Oh, that's such a good question. So, so dark matter. We think they do actually behave quite differently. So, when we write down the sort of equations of motion for these these components, we write down the equations of motion of a dark matter particle as simply something that uh, behaves gravitationally. Uh, and clusters, um, but just doesn't ha interact <coughs> electromagnetically. When we call dark, when we call sort of normal dark energy, we, we it's a cosmological constant, a vacuum energy. It's not a particle, and so when you write it down, it's just a background energy that has, for example, an equation of state of minus one, whereas the equation of state of, of dust would be um, would not would be zero. So they are they actually are quite different. We think. Okay, if we can thank Joanna again.